we are driving through East New York, Brooklyn right now, which is one of the neighborhoods with the highest number of fast food restaurants in the city. I see a Wendy's, a Burger King, a Checkers. Checkers has two for $4 spicy chicken or crispy fish. What kind of fish is that? Like this area is mostly brown and black. So Whole Foods, you don't see them here, but you'll see two fish sandwiches for $4. Around the corner from that strip of fast food underneath the three train is East New York Farm. Oh, I see. I see we got some action over here. Some kale. These are the dino kales. These ones are really perfect for salads, especially with some like salmon, some like garlic roasted salmon. Okay, okay, chef. I hear you, chef. I hear you. Aisha Maharis came to East New York from Jamaica when she was 12. Now she oversees the farm and its weekly farmer's market the only one in the neighborhood. The farmer's market is now open officially. <laughs> when it comes to this neighborhood specifically, what are the food options like for the folks? Very scarce. In terms of our supermarket, it's not fresh, it's not organic, and it's very expensive. The closest supermarket that might be doable or accessible in terms of the fresh produce that's available is really far. You hear terms like food apartheid, food justice, food desert. What do these terms mean? It's basically purposely put in certain restaurants and junk food into poor neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color. They're being trapped over repeatedly in that system. Nearly 40 million people across the country live in neighborhoods like East New York without easy access to healthy, fresh food. It's not just that there aren't enough supermarkets. The problem is systemic and rooted in structural racism. Today, black neighborhoods have fewer supermarkets and more fast food joints than white neighborhoods, something that can't be explained away by income. What can explain it is segregation. For decades, black people were systematically denied loans and excluded from certain neighborhoods across the country, and food patterns followed. Grocery stores followed the white folks out of the suburbs through supermarket redlining. At first, fast food corporations also targeted richer, whiter suburbs. But by the 1980s, in droves, they were moving into urban, mostly black areas, which had fewer food alternatives. Put it right here. So when I first came here, I wanted to feel connected to my culture back home, where I'm used to fresh produce. I'm used to going out in front of my yard, and I have mango, and I have a soursop, and I have um, June plum. And those are things that I could just like pick from off the tree. Some folks don't even know what those things are. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to folks is like, if you want healthy food, just go get healthy food. Healthy food is always stigmatized to be a white thing, expensive and uh, unappealing. If it's not something that you could afford easily so you could incorporate it in your meals, how am I gonna be able to get it? People are losing connection with their heritage, their ancestors. If you're not purposely bringing that to the table, then how can you feel connected to food and fresh food? And especially if you have McDonald's in front of your face every Yo, day. Yo, I'm saying, if you got three kids and you on a you know, fixed you, income, trying to make it work for you and your family. You have no time to cook. You have no time to intentionally think about what your kid is going to eat. One business owner in nearby Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, is trying to make that decision easier. Ali Ahmed used to run bodegas, what New Yorkers call a corner store or a deli. Now he runs Brain Food. Why did you get out of the bodega business? OK, you've made all this money off this neighborhood. Now do something better for the neighborhood. Like, why do you need to keep selling this garbage? And literally, what Brain Food was, was a cleaned up version of a bodega. Like, we took all the crap out of there. All the, the high fructose corn syrup cakes, the drinks that had, were packed with 30 grams of sugar and 12 ounces. We got rid of all that stuff and just put a choice that, you know, everything in here would be healthy. Er. Ahmed's bread and butter are meal preps. A full plate of grains, meat, and veg for just $5. We had to make it affordable because we don't want eating healthy to be always, oh, only rich people can eat healthy. There's always something you can get in here, full meal for five bucks. Mm-hmm. 
with a little spice, a little sriracha, then I go home and go to sleep. <laughs> Bed-Stuy is gentrifying, which means more places to get a salad, but also higher rents and community displacement. Ahmed is catering to both those coming in and those who were there before. When you first arrived here, what was the reaction from, like, the neighborhood neighborhood? Like, the people? It was a little tough. Like, you know, they thought of us as just another gentrified business. As soon as they see Kel and Kinwa, they put you in the category, man. Like. <laughs> Those are the two I mean, that... when I see Kelly and Kiwa, <laughs> I'm going to put you in the category, to be honest. I grew up in the hood, man. I'm not going to, you know, like, forget about them. Like... When you were growing up in New York, what kind of food options did you have? All I remember seeing as a kid was McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Popeye's, nothing but just, these were the options. Mm -hmm. Uh, even the bodegas back then didn't have salads and smoothies like they do nowadays. Not gonna lie, in the back of my mind, the backup plan was if it doesn't work, I'm flipping it back into a bodega. But... Really? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so far, his model is working. He's opening up a second location in downtown Brooklyn, not far from a Whole Foods. This is the new spot, huh? This is the new spot. Doesn't look like much now, but in a month, they'll be. Good to go. And what used to be here? Uh, a checkers fast food joint used to be here. So look at you. You are literally like replacing fast food with healthy food. Offering more choices beyond just fast food or expensive food is what Harris is trying to do too. The farm put out a cookbook of recipes from community members and puts on cooking demos. The recipe is from our, our cookbook, East New York Farms. Oh, ain't that fancy? Their widest reach comes from the high schoolers they employ, like Jaden Shack, who's 17 and has worked at the farm for three years. If you weren't working here, it's a uh, high likely of a chance that you'd be working at a fast food restaurant. Yeah, I probably worked at the McDonald's right behind my house. Really? I'm not gonna hold you. Nah, <laughs> I, it's literally <laughs> two minutes of a walk behind me. Oh. And you're not afraid of that? I'm Jamaican. The sous chef taking over. There we go. Smells good, right? What do your peers think? At first, my peers actually made fun of me. Uh, it, it was a big, like, struggle to come to work and have everyone be like, oh, you work on the farm, you're a slave and everything. Really? Yeah, it was a, a, it was a whole bunch of mean comments. And I used to lie at times and be like, oh, no, I don't work on no farms. What are you talking about? They do make fun of me. But no, some of them actually try to join the program to learn more about it. What is your hope for the future? Or food in general should become a human right. It shouldn't be viewed as a luxury, especially healthy food. No one should be forced to eat something because the government says so or because these huge corporations is like, hey, we want to put a McDonald's here for our profit because I know that your community could only afford this. And the hope is for people to embrace their roots and getting back to growing their own, their own food.